Students, please be seated. We are pleased to have you present with us at this occasion where we honor achievements. We honor achievements. Achievements in the School of Nursing. I also welcome those who are with us live streaming on the School of Nursing YouTube channel. Now tonight, we remember our beloved colleague, Dr. Judy Kanzeri. There is a paragraph in your program telling you about Judy and her contributions to the School of Nursing and to the state. A highlight of this evening is the Judy C. Kanzeri Memorial Nursing Lectureship. This lectureship is a living tribute, a living tribute that keeps her memory alive. And we are pleased to have with us her daughter, Mrs. Pamela Campbell. Would you please stand, Mrs. Campbell? Thank you for coming. Now, as you can see on your program, it is titled Honoring Achievements. It is the achievements earned by students that we honor tonight. And these achievements are centered on learning and scholarship. Centered on learning and scholarship. These two values are at the heart of the good work we do here in the School of Nursing. Students are guided to study and to learn the foundations of nursing as well as knowledge development embedded in the scholarly endeavors of both students and faculty. Both learning and scholarship are at the core of the science of nursing, at the core of the science of nursing, based on enhancing health and making a difference in the quality of people's lives. What we honor tonight then is a valuing for the science of nursing that is lived in learning and scholarship. Tonight's event makes explicit these values in both the lectures and the awards. And so let us begin. And now Dean Tara Halsey Dean of the School of Nursing, will welcome you and introduce the speaker, Dean Halsey.
Good evening. Faculty, students, family, and friends, it is my pleasure to welcome you to the Judy C. Kenzari Lectureship and School of Nursing Award presentations. We will also be inducting the newest members of the Alpha Rho Chapter of Sigma Theta Tau International Honor Society for Nursing. We are happy to have you here with us to celebrate some of the best and brightest of our nursing students. Joining us are our School of Nursing faculty members. We have always known that they're very dedicated, hardworking, knowledgeable, and experienced, and their skill at educating greatly contributes to the success of our students. But what we've learned through this pandemic is how committed they are to the nursing profession and to the communities that we serve. We are incredibly fortunate to have some of the best nurses in the country working side by side with us at West Virginia University. Nursing faculty, will you still please stand and be recognized? This evening, I have the pleasure of introducing this year's speaker, Dr. Lisa Weesey. Dr. Lisa Kirk Weesey is an associate professor at C.E. Lynn College of Nursing at Florida Atlantic University. She received her Bachelor and Master of Science in Nursing from the University of Virginia and her PhD in Nursing from Florida Atlantic University. Dr. Weesey is board certified in advanced public health and in gerontological nursing. She is a certified dementia care practitioner and a certified nurse educator. A Morgantown native, Dr. Weesey is nationally recognized for her community-based participatory research in rural settings. Her research focuses on empowering rural, older, underserved adults to lengthen the time that they can live at home and age in place. Most recently, her work received funding for three years by the National Institute of Aging and the National Institutes of Health to conduct community-based participatory research in faith-based rural settings. At this time, I would like to introduce you and hope that you will help me welcome Dr. Lisa Weesey. Good evening, and thank you for that lovely introduction, Dean Halsey. So, it, can you hear me okay? I am deeply grateful for this opportunity to return to my hometown and share my work, which was and continues to be inspired by the core values of the people of West Virginia. I would like to start by sharing a little of my family story which began back in the 1800s when Nora Bell Browning, daughter of a well-respected family in Southern West Virginia, met and fell in love with a coal miner, Thomas Jefferson Johnson. When Nora Bell's family found out her father forbade her to see Big Tom, Tom resolved to win his true love. So he began working multiple jobs. He started the Rosedale Coal Company, the first of four companies he created during the height of his success. Big Tom returned to McDowell County and married Nora Bell with her parents' approval. They moved to Baker's Ridge, just outside Morgantown, and had five children. My mother, Ora Lee, was the third oldest, seen here with her father behind her. Much to everyone's surprise, she was selected by my grandfather to run his companies on his retirement. This was unheard of 60 years ago. A woman coal executive? Orly still found time to be a truly loving and caring mother, dedicated volunteer, and community leader. She served multiple times on the board of the Friends of WVU Hospital, among other notable positions, including the Appalachian Planning Commission. She was featured several times in the Morgantown newspapers and was in the who's who of American business executives. She is pictured here with my brother, Philip, being inducted as the first mother and son dyad of Rotary International. While doing all this, she instilled my love for the West Virginia Hills by taking my brother and I camping many summers at Cooper's Rocks. When thinking about this lecture and returning to Morgantown, I recall my mother referring to people she admired in West Virginia as the salt of the earth. Although I had an idea, I never asked her about her own meaning of the phrase and decided to think on it further. Salt is used as a preservative and brings out flavor. I believe someone who is the salt of the earth preserves what is good and also makes things better. 
Salt is also crucial for maintaining human health. Without salt, referred to scientifically as sodium, our nerves and muscles would not function. Yet too much salt can be a threat to one's heart, kidney, or brain, as some of you who watch your salt intake are aware. So to be the salt of the earth can mean one who helps others to function at their best. This is what today's message is, creating a culture of caring for those whom you are going to be called to nurse so they can function at their best level of health. Creating a culture of caring as a nurse is helping others to live healthier lives. I believe this necessitates grounding nursing practice in caring science. What is meant by caring science in nursing? It is defined here as a body of knowledge arrived at through intentional research, excuse me, and theory development focused on the relationship of caring to health, healing, and well being of the whole person within the context of the family, community, society, and global environment. You may say to yourself, of course, nursing is caring. But in truth, effective caring requires holistic scientific inquiry, which leads to theories that produce concepts to guide actions. There are varied theories and models for applying caring science to specific arenas of teaching, research, and practice. At the Christine E. Lynn College of Nursing at Florida Atlantic University, faculty and students are expected to ground their research projects in a caring science theory that resonates with them. In our practice, we are charged with living the principles of caring science in our interactions with those we serve, whether in the hospital, boardroom, or community. This is referred to as the dance of caring persons. This dance is what sustains a culture of caring. Before I share with you how I have applied the principles of caring science in my own research to create a culture of caring, I would like to provide a brief snapshot of several of the key concepts from the Nursing is Caring Theory by Boykin and Shonifer which I chose to guide my own work. First is living an authentic presence. Many of you are able to relate easily to this concept. Appalachians are known for their sincere willingness to help one another, such as mowing a housebound neighbor's lawn. And as a nurse, authentic presence means focusing on the needs of the patient as we speak with them, rather than thinking about what we have to get done in the next hour. The second concept is coming to know the person in the in-between. This means that as you develop a relationship with a person or community, you come to know them in ways that is beyond what is easily evident. For example, as a nurse, you receive a report that Mr. Jones is an 84-year-old retired minor who will not take his new medication. After spending some time with him and asking him about a picture in his room, you discover that the photo is of his own family member only family member, a devoted daughter who calls daily to check up on him. As you further talk, you realize his refusal to take his medicine is because he mistakenly thinks it is going to make him so groggy that he will not be awake for his daughter's phone call. The third caring so concept that significantly guides my work is the question, what matters most to you today? Finding out what mattered most to Mr. Jones allowed he and the nurses to work together, problem solve, and remove barriers to care. In rural cultures, person often define health as not an absence of disease, but the ability to keep working or parenting or engaging in whatever brings them a sense of purpose in life. This is what matters most to them. Therefore, any efforts to improve health must first attend to what matters most. This concept in caring science has been the key to creating a culture of caring in my own efforts to promote health in underserved communities. Let me tell you a little bit about the rural communities I now serve. They are at the tip of Lake Okeechobee in South Central Florida. So you see the lake there, and they're all right here. If I drive north from my home, whoops, oh, I forgot about that. <laughs> we have a lot of those too. <laughs> okay. um, so if I drive up to 95, West Palm Beach and then Palm Beach, which is one of the top 20 wealthiest um, towns in the nation, and then go out this road, you hit Belle Glade, this red star here. That is the poorest town in the state of Florida. So this area is referred to as what the Health and Human Resources uh, Services Administration refers to as a hot zone, meaning there are medically underserved area, medically underserved population, and a health professional shortage area. 
To find out what matters most to this community in which I wanted to make a difference, I looked for ways as a nurse that I could get involved and come to know the community, especially the older adults. I began by calling one of the subsidized housing facilities for ages 50 and over and asked if I could come start checking blood pressures and weights every month. I also brought healthy snacks with me. This led to another subsidized housing unit and the local senior center asking me to come. I also brought students with me. This led me to meeting more gatekeepers and stakeholders in the community and I formed my first community advisory board. I was really heartened by the community's interest in knowing their blood pressure and weight, and I also started doing spot glucose checks as they wanted their sugar checked. I truly believe that the only way to create a culture of caring is through a community-based participatory research approach of which the Community Advisory Board is a centerpiece. During the journey of creating a culture of caring for old rural old adults, adults, I was awarded, as you heard, my first NIH grant to expand our education and screening to other towns in the Glades. Upon the advice of my advisory board, I began working through the churches. This faith-based approach has really been the ultimate key to creating this culture of caring in our rural communities. I followed Dr. Nancy Schoenberg's model, Faith Moves Mountains, which has been highly successful in Appalachian, Kentucky over the past 20 years in combating diabetes and cancers of the breast, prostate, and lung. Per her model, I work with church leaders, which include members of my advisory board, to identify what matters most. Then we invite able and interested church members to be trained as faith-based health educators and research assistants. We meet weekly on Zoom to plan activities and go in person to a different church monthly after services to conduct health screenings, education, and research. We do wear masks and conduct a quick COVID screening. Incidentally, this work was recently cited as an exemplar of community-based participatory research on the National Institutes of Health website. Living the principles of the caring science framework, such as authentic presence, coming to know the other, and identifying what matters most in faith-based communities have been instrumental in creating this culture of caring. Other examples to finding out what matters most has involved water, computers, and social clubs. What do these three things have in common? I found out early on that what mattered most to people in the Glades was obtaining clean drinking water. Many older adults would buy bottled water rather than drink cloudy water resulting from outdated pipes, then pay for medicines, fresh fruits, and vegetables. Lately, the toxic algae blooms in Lake Okeechobee have added to water disparities. To address this, we have been able to supply water to them through collaborating with community, state, and federal organizations. When the pandemic struck, the only way we could reach older adults was through telehealth. But 51% of residents do not know how to use a computer and 50% don't own one. So we combined several small local organization grants into large enough ones to supply computers and enlist the high school students to train the older residents in using computers. This intergenerational approach has become a tremendous success story that is benefiting both groups. When we began conducting focus groups to find out what matters most, with the quarantine restrictions lifting, we found out that young adults have nowhere to go to socialize or exercise. There are no coffee shops or movie theaters. We discovered there are no organized events or clubs in the three senior living facilities, even pre-COVID-19. We are now assisting with bringing exercise such as this chair yoga, monthly mental health events, neighborhood walking clubs to the Glades. We also found that caregivers wanted access to our robotic pet therapy project for their loved ones. This therapeutic interactive pet or TIP program is a cost-effective and sustainable way of promoting positive mood and emotions among persons with dementia. It establishes a means of reciprocal caring. We also just began a mobile health van to visit a different rural church weekly. Maintaining this culture of caring for rural older adults is being that salt of the earth by being authentically present coming to truly know your patients and communities and addressing what matters most to them so that you can help them to achieve improved health. Following the nursing is caring theoretical framework to create a culture of caring and promote the health of the older adults I serve has empowered me to address a disease which kills more people, as I said, than breast and prostate cancer combined. That disease is Alzheimer's. Many of you know that Alzheimer's is the most common type of dementia in many places. And a classic sign is short-term memory loss. 
We now have tests to measure abnormal levels of beta amyloid and tau proteins, which lead to the formation of these plaques, amyloid plaques, and tau tangles. And that leads to this kind of brain disease. I'm especially excited about the new blood tests as they will be much more affordable and easier to administer in rural settings. Forewarned is forearmed. These newer means of detection are especially important in under-resourced rural communities that face higher dementia risk. For example, the Glades, Florida region is 94% racially ethnically diverse, which includes African Americans, Hispanic Americans, and Haitian Creole residents. Consequently, the Glades experience all 12 potentially modifiable risk factors for dementia. Many of these risk factors actually start as external influences early in childhood, and so are referred to as life course factors, such as those stated here. These potentially modifiable factors can substantially impact one's risk for progressing to mild cognitive impairment, which then increases one risk for dementia. The importance of life course factors can be seen here. In normal aging, the body and brain gradually slow down, but intelligence remains stable. Persons with mild cognitive impairment may have notable problems with memory or other core brain functions, but impairments are not sufficient as to interfere with daily life. However, dementia encompasses a range of neurodegenerative brain disorders, which do interfere. Modifying life course factors can help prevent or delay the onset of mild cognitive impairment. Oops, sorry about that. Right here, to get delay or present that, or present help prevent from going from mild cognitive impairment to Alzheimer's disease. It would make sense that the thing I'm most familiar with, I'm stumbling over the most. <laughs> okay. Uh, for example, in the Glades, normal um, with a 41% poverty rate and known as a food desert, where ironically fresh fruits and vegetables are difficult to purchase, malnutrition and obesity are common. Eating foods that are more affordable but high in fat over time can increase vascular dementia risk. Therefore, we are teaching folks, folks in the glades to eliminate one food high in sugar or fat daily. Sometimes we have to say a week and then try to get to a daily. <laughs> teaching others to find culturally acceptable ways to improve dietary choices is vital to creating a culture of caring. Another life course factor is a lack of exercise. Beginning in early childhood, it is important to be active. However, in the Glades, Florida, you do not routinely see children playing outside. There are several reasons for this, ranging from lack of nearby parks and sports fields to air pollution from sugarcane burning that you saw on a slide earlier, and lack of organized teams such as soccer clubs. We're writing a new federal grant to begin addressing these social disparities through a what matters most approach. I believe that West Virginians often have a distinct advantage in maintaining health. Let me explain. Two studies of over 5,000 persons, of which 2,000 were followed over 22 years, showed that personalities with less neuroticism and greater conscientiousness had less incidence of dementia. This means that persons who help their neighbors and are less focused on themselves have lower rates of dementia. Go Mountaineers! Lack of education in childhood is recognized as another life course factor contributing to dementia risk. In my own research, where many older adults report zero years of formal education, the average health literacy level ranges from third to eighth grade level. The high school graduation rate is only 60%. Compared to the state of West Virginia, with high school graduation rates over 80%, this is important considering that the relative risk of Alzheimer's disease is decreased by 83% among persons with 12 or more years of education. Go Mountaineers! <laughs> Furthermore, lifelong learning helps to build cognitive reserve and decrease dementia risk. I want to highlight that addressing these life course factors at any age can decrease the risk of mild cognitive impairment and dementia. This is stunning news and is important to rural communities where maintaining independence is paramount and fatalistic attitudes are no longer the norm. Instead, people want to know about their health. They want to know what they can do to avoid disease. They also want to know how to take care of themselves so they won't be a burden to their family members. As nurses, we are well positioned to teach folks in improving nutrition, stopping smoking, managing diabetes and high blood pressure, minimizing alcohol intake, preventing traumatic head injuries, 
Socializing with others and continuing to learn are several ways we can teach others to modify their risk for cognitive decline. This picture is of my nephew Tyler doing just that at one of our earlier Appalachian outreaches. What does this information regarding life course factors mean for us as nurses? It means that we can create a culture of caring for rural older adults by promoting health through the three levels of prevention, education, screening, and effective disease management. An example of creating this culture of caring for older adults is what transpired after my mother kept asking us over and over again during Thanksgiving dinner, does anybody want some more green beans? My brother Philip immediately took our mom to see her primary care provider here in Morgantown, who conducted cognitive screening and additional tests to rule out other causes. And unlike many providers at that time, immediately started my mother on Aricept and Amenda. Now, many of you have heard that medications do not help with Alzheimer's disease. No drug currently treats it directly, although here at the WVU Rockefeller Neuroscience Institutes, they're making great gains in developing treatments, and I just got to say, go Mountaineers! <laughs> However, it does help to manage symptoms in an estimated third of cases. My mother was one of those cases. She was able to reside in her own home seven years after diagnosis until shortly before passing. Early detection was the key to her quality of life. Benefits of early detection include involving the person living with dementia in their own decision-making, preserving functioning through healthy behaviors, allowing for treatment of other medical conditions that may be worsening the symptoms, and providing time for long-term care planning. And there's my brother Phil with mom. How do you motivate persons to engage in pursuing health to create that culture of care? By referring back to nursing theory. For example, families often know what matters most. My brother Phil and his family attended to what mattered most to our mother. Seen here is my niece Lizzie, nephew Tyler, their mother Tracy, and my niece Caitlin. And they are here with me now. Without them, I wouldn't be here with you now because they were able to take care of her while I was in my doctoral program. Mother and son watched the evening news together, talked about what was going on in town, and perused the news together. During season, he would go to our mother's apartment to either listen or watch the Mountaineers football or basketball games. When my mother had to endure the treatment for macular degeneration, which meant keeping her head down for two weeks, my brother rigged up the television on the floor so she could continue to watch the news. He took her every Saturday to get her hair done. This was an especially important activity for, as you might see from those earlier pictures, she took great pride in her appearance. With my brother's help, my mother maintained contact with her WVU Tri-Delta sisters. It is important to remember, however, that as nurses, we need to educate family members that it is also acceptable and actually essential that they ask for help. This can be especially challenging for rural residents who take great pride in being self-sufficient. My brother had the strength to ask for help from his own children and their mother when he needed it. These family members also help with visits and outings and trips and socialization. These vital activities help to delay the progression of dementia. Applying nursing as caring theory to practice also means that we can make a difference, not just in the families we encounter, but also in our rural communities. We can provide education in locations that might not have access to the latest information regarding the importance of life course factors that what a child experiences now will impact their burdens for chronic illnesses later in life. As nurses, we can tap into persons' desires to remain independent and increase their motivation through perceptions that they can do something about the disease. As nurses, we can teach parents to participate in parenting and health nutrition classes and work with families so that children will stay in school. We can facilitate adults to attend continuing education classes we can decrease isolation among older adults by working with high school to start programs where students visit older adults, wheelchair-dependent residents to get out of their house by walking them in their wheelchairs around the neighborhood, and in making check-in phone calls, which we call sunshine calls in the state of Florida. As nurses, we can advocate for healthier school nutrition programs and recess in schools. As nurses, we could participate in vaccination programs, pair pets with vets, and contact our legislatures to increase funding for home health nurses. Creating these cultures of caring, grounded in nursing as caring concepts, are especially needed in our rural areas. 
These images represent ways in which you can be supported in creating a culture of caring in your rural communities. The Rural Nurse Organization and the Rural Health Information Hub can connect you to grants, training, and outreach opportunities. As nurses, we can help those we serve to prepare for their future story by being authentically present in our relationships with them and discovering what matters most to them in the pursuit of healthier behaviors. It means that we could tap into the pride and hard work ethic that rural residents are known for so that we could support them in growing and lear learning and changing. We will make a difference in helping people understand that beginning with children, it is important to play outside, eat fresh vegetables, read, participate in acts of kindness, and socialize with others. That is how we can build cultures of caring now for our future older adults. This is me playing Earth. Dream big. You are the nurses who are about to show your corners of the world that the new normal means to create cultures of caring. One final thought. As I looked on the WVU College of Nursing website, I realize even if you were not born here, living here for a time changes you for the better. I believe that each of us can be that effective caring nurse, the salt of the earth, preserving what is good, making things better, and helping others to function at their best, either in spite of or because of their story. Thank you for the honor of sharing in, with you in this important occasion. Congratulations. Dr. Weesey, thank you so much for sharing your oh expertise. <laughs> and um, I want to know how we can recruit you back here. <laughs> and go Mountaineers. <laughs> yeah, go Mountaineers. That's right. Thank you, Dean Halsey. Thank you so thank much. Thank you. Oh, my God. Next, we will have presentation of medallion awards. This is an awarding of endowed professorship medallions. These medallions are awarded by West Virginia University Foundation, the West Virginia University Foundation. Now, I thought I would let you know a little bit about what an endowed professor is. An endowed professorship is a donor-funded special academic appointment that carries prestige and responsibility. These positions demonstrate the strongest commitment on the part of a donor and of the university to a particular academic program. To hold a professorship is one of the highest accolades a university can bestow. One of the highest accolades a university can bestow. This evening, we have two awardees. Dr. Tara Halsey is the endowed professor of the E. Jane Martin Professor of Nursing. And we have a medallion for you. Okay. Now, this professorship was ordered, was awarded, excuse me, uh, by Jane Martin, who we thought we would have her with us tonight. However, she couldn't come, and we are grateful to her for making this uh, award to us. The next awardee is Dr. Uberat Piam Jerry Eckel. And she, for this professorship, she is the WVUH Evidence Based Research Endowed Professor. This, this, uh, this professorship was endowed by WVUH. And so uh, we are pleased to have with us 
Mary Fanning. Would you please stand, Mary? Mary Fanning is the vice president. Okay, let me tell you who she is. She, she is the vice president of nursing clinical services. And we're very glad you could come with us. And we are grateful for this award. Here you go. This is your award. You are welcome. So now we move to the awards part of the program. Dr. Roger Carpenter will read the names and the specifics of the award, and Dean Halsey will present the awards to the students. Are you ready? Uh, the 2022 student award recipients are as follows. The PhD award for excellence, Kim Wallace. The CRNA award for excellence, Shane Brost. The DNP award for excellence, Beth Minchow. The MSN Award for Excellence, Rachel Balcourt. The BSN Award for Excellence, Senior Student, Lauren Adams. The BSN Award for Excellence, Junior Student, Andrew Johnson. The Dr. Patsy Hessen Huslam Public Health Nursing Award, Casey Lobin. The PhD Alumni Award for Leadership, Brad Phillips. The BSN Alumni Award for Leadership, Sydney Oldacre. Tonight, we are also welcoming new inductees into the Alpha Rho chapter of Sigma Theta Tau International Honor Society for Nursing. Sigma members demonstrate excellence in scholarship and exceptional achievements in nursing. It is truly an honor to be part of such a respected and progressive organization. And I can speak for that personally, having served four years on the board of directors and multiple different um, communities and international liaison roles within Sigma. So I um, definitely am excited for those of you who will be joining this wonderful, wonderful organization. I would now like to introduce Ms. Amanda Edwards, president of Alpha Rho chapter to um, carry on this ceremony. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Amanda Edwards. Welcome to the induction ceremony for the Alpha Rho chapter of Sigma. Thank you for celebrating this special occasion with us. The names you see, let's see. Where's the name? Oh, let's go back. The names you see here are those who serve on the Alpha Rho board. Many of these board members are here with us this evening. 
For more than 90 years, Sigma has been recognizing and celebrating excellence in scholarship, leadership, and service within nursing and midwifery. The Honor Society, today known as Sigma, was founded as Sigma Theta Tau in 1922 by six nursing students at Indiana University. From those six founding members, our organization has grown to more than 135,000 active members in more than 560 chapters in over 100 countries around the world. Sigma also collaborates with several global organizations to improve the health of the world's people, including representation at the United Nations. This offers members the opportunity to extend their reach outside of their own communities. We are excited and filled with pride today to welcome our new inductees into our diverse and global membership. Sigma members are leaders at all levels of the healthcare industry. The society only extends membership to students in baccalaureate or graduate level programs who have demonstrated superior academic achievement, academic integrity, and professional leadership potential, and to nurse leaders, leaders who exhibit exceptional achievements in nursing. Our membership includes top-notch nursing executives, clinicians, educators, researchers, policy, policy makers, entrepreneurs, and others. You are among this distinguished group of nurses, students and professionals, who have met or exceeded the rigorous standards required to receive an invitation to join Sigma, and you truly deserve our congratulations. Our founders chose the Greek letters, Sigma, Theta, Ta, taken from the Greek words meaning love, courage, and honor, as they believe them to be the enduring values that are the root of the nursing profession. Our crest, which adorns your membership certificate, symbolizes these enduring values, reminding us of our commitment to wisdom and discernment as represented by the eye, service, professional endeavor, and strength, strength of leadership as represented by the pillars of stone at the right and left, and knowledge as represented by the lamp. Our key, embedded in the membership pin, reminds us of our charge to uphold love, courage, and honor, and is a symbol of scholarship. The cup denotes the satisfaction of professional life. The circle with its six stars represents our six founders. The lamp is the lamp of knowledge and the letters in black represent our charge. Remember that our key symbolizes your commitment to nursing excellence. The purpose of the ceremony is not, not only to honor you as a new member and celebrate your successes, but it also serves as our pledge to you to support you throughout your nursing career and to be a lifelong resource for you. At this time, we will receive into membership these outstanding new members. Inductees, um, please feel free to recite this pledge with me. Please accept the privileges and response. Let me go forward. I accept membership in Sigma Theta Tau International and I pledge to fulfill its commitment to nursing excellence, knowledge, service, and leadership throughout my career. Thank you, inductees. Please be seated. Well, or stay seated. <laughs> Just kidding. All right. So helping us to recognize and congratulate Alpha Rose new members are Susan McKenrick, our Vice President and Best Styles Counselor. All right. New members will now be recognized as we read the inductee names and they officially become members of the Alpha Row chapter. Eliza Barker. Gina Bradford.
Emily Cunningham. Gracie Daly. Travis Dye. Alexandria Foley. Angela Ginangeli. Megan Guzda. Joelle Harvey. Rachel Lamb. Patrick Murphy. Sydney Pennington. Noel Shreve. Julie Steer. Brittany Triano. Congratulations to these new Sigma members. Now that you are official members of Sigma, the opportunities to become involved, to grow and develop as leaders, and to contribute to the nursing profession are virtually endless. We welcome you into this prestigious and global network of nurses working every day to change lives and advance healthcare. Thank you. And I'll turn it back over to Dr. Smith. So now we are coming to the end of the program and I would like to, to present some recognitions. First of all, I would like to recognize Lisa Weesey's family who are with us. Would you please all stand? It's a whole bunch of them. I thought there were more. Good, good. There we go. There we go. Okay. Next, I would like to acknowledge the students who have been honored with awards. Now, these are students who value learning and have put time and energy, put time and energy into excelling in their courses. They are the future and the essence of what we honor here tonight. And my dear students, I know that everyone here in this audience wishes you all the best as you move forward and continue to excel in nursing. Let's give these students a rousing round of applause. I would like to acknowledge the committee who planned and makes this event happen. Would you please hold your applause till the end? And I ask everyone to stand when I read your name, please. Tina Antokiner. Tina, there she is. Roger Carpenter. Greg Cave. Are you here, Greg? He's out back. Suzanne Gross. Suzanne Gross. Wendy Holdren. 
Brandy Toothman, and Tiffany Samuels Walker. Is Tiffany here with us tonight? Good. Very good. Now, yes. Let me tell you, this group is a wonderful, responsible, working together committee who make this event possible. We owe them a large debt of gratitude, believe me. Okay, now I know Dean Halsey already asked us to recognize the faculty and, and she talked about the commitment of, of our faculty at this time of complicating health challenges. I would like to ask them to stand again. Why? Because it is, stand again faculty. Stand <laughs> Why? <laughs> Yay. Yes, yes, yes. Now, it is these men and women, the faculty, who are actively engaged in education and scholarship. And it is the faculty who spark learning that is deep and real. Learning that is deep and real among our students. They are the heart of all we do in the School of Nursing. And again, we thank you. We also have emerita faculty with us tonight. Would you please stand? Please stand. All of you stand. I'm so glad. Where are you? Did you leave? There they are. There they are. There they are. Okay. Yes. 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 The emerita faculty are retired faculty who continue to contribute to the School of Nursing. And we are always so very pleased to have you with us. So then we have come to the close of this time of honoring achievements. Achievements rooted in scholarship and learning that will make a difference in the lives of the people we serve as nurse. Tonight, you witnessed a lecture centered on a caring nursing framework. I hope you heard that. A lecture centered on a caring nursing framework that guides practice to enhance health and well being for rural people. And you have been present to acknowledge student awards, awarding of professorships, and induction of students into a Sigma Theta Tau. We thank everyone for being with us and invite you to join us at a reception outside in the auditorium where we will continue to celebrate and reminisce and talk with each other. We thank you. Good night. Students' voice.